Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to start by thanking Jacques and the organizing committee and FETE board for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's my second time in Istanbul. And uh, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to make it, but fortunately, here I am. And uh, I saw some of our students outside, and they said, are you ready? And I said, no, <laughs> I'm not ready. Um, we're never ready, because everything is constantly in a, in a process. <coughs> and I already heard Gideon, and I heard Emmy, and I heard Katerina, so uh, there are so many thoughts in my mind. <clears throat> and I have a PowerPoint. And I don't know how much of it I'm going to share because, uh, you know, when Jacques invited me and said, well, um, send me a title and, and an abstract, that was sometime in November. And the first thought that came to my mind when I read Building Bridges was immediately the me other collection, or I should say the me other dilemma, or as I write in my title, dialectical tension, and I will explain why. And then uh, as I started preparing, I also had the opportunity to have a Zoom call with my dear friend and esteemed colleague, Dr. Eric Craig. And he said, well, what are you presenting about? I said, well, about the me other dilemma. And I said, me other dilemma? We are all one. What, what, what kind of a dilemma are you talking about? Which is a question that he has very often raised and a, a discussion that we very often have. And he so nicely says, you constitute my world and I constitute your world. And right now I constitute your world and you constitute my world. And we are all in the world together. So what was I what's going to talk about? Many years ago, uh, I also had the opportunity to, to, met, to meet with Ernesto Spinelli in our first visit with Yignasta, the Hellenic Association for Existential Psychology in uh, Great Britain for um, the SEA conference. And we had a discussion and I, I sort of brought up the subject of self. I said, self? There is no self. And I was like taken aback. What do you mean there is no self? I must admit that I come from the existential humanistic tradition and I've, I was trained in a very uh, psychodynamic kind of approach. And there was always for me the quest to find myself. And I had this question as a teenager, who was I? And now somebody was saying, there is no self. So my views have, of course, evolved and changed since I was a student. But um, I wanted to share with you a few of my thoughts and, and to take it even to a, a further micro level, because Amy talked about the world and Katerina talked about the family. And I'm going to talk about the individual. So I understand and I learned from my friend, uh, Eric 
Craig and, and all of the phenomenological theorists that there is an ontological and an ontic. And Gideon talked about that as well. So we are all human beings and we all share a lot of common existential givens. We are all in space, we are all in time, we are all in bodies. But still, psychology and psychotherapy deals primarily with the ontic and has to do with how I experience my existence and how I am in the world. And this is what I was trying to figure out when, since I was in college. <clears throat> so in my effort to do that, um, I created this kind of um, theory, which I'm not going to get into, just uh, to show this uh, DNA helix, because it feels like our lived experiences are like part of our skin, right? It's who we are. So we have our biological DNA, but we could say we have also psychological DNA, a psychic DNA that is comprised of all of our lived experiences. So as I said, in my effort to understand myself and in answering this very silly question of, is there anything that is really truly mine? Or am I just the result of my biology and my upbringing? I haven't really answered that, but I'm still trying to understand if there is something that is uniquely mine and um, that has not to do with my genes or my upbringing. But I do believe in this idea of freedom and free will. And I think although we are thrown into the world with all sorts of givens, uh, we each have choices that we make throughout life. But what happens in our upbringing has a great impact. And I think especially in the first years of life, where we haven't developed yet what Emmy was talking about, this ability to contemplate and to think and to sort of reason and figure out what is happening in the world, we experience everything in our body and through our senses. So everything is sort of imprinted in our, in our body, but not just in our body, in our mind, as I'll show later. <clears throat> and um, we constantly evolve. And sometimes I felt in psychotherapy and I hear my clients also say, well, but, and then again about the same thing. And I say, no, we're not talking exactly about the same thing. We are moving, hopefully, some, somewhat of an upward spiral. Um, and this, this is where my humanistic background comes from. You know, I, I believe in self-actualization. I believe that we have a potential and, and that we are responsible for making the best that we can with whatever we have. So um, I'm just going to focus on the beginning of life because I think it's very crucial. So we spent nine months in the womb and we are utterly fused and connected with mother. We do nothing on our own. And then suddenly we're out in the world and we have to start doing everything on our own. We have to start breathing first of all. And then we start to start eat and defecate and do all of the physical things that uh, will keep us alive. But we're of course for quite a few years completely dependent on caretakers. Uh, human beings have the longest period of dependence from all other animals. It takes quite a long time to be able to survive on our own. And of course it takes ages <laughs> to be able 
to separate emotionally and to be able to stand on our own as the human being we are. And, and I think that this is how I understand authenticity as well. And I like very much what Gabo Mate says, that we sacrifice our authenticity because we, we really need our parents to take care of us. We need others to take care of us. So we are obliged to follow what they want and what they say if we want to survive. And that is true for quite a few years. So, I had, uh, since I was in college, a very great interest in attachment theory and Bowlby's theory, which started in the 1960s. Um, and, of course, you all probably know about his attachment theory and, and this kind of bond that is created between mother and infant. And he talked about four different types, four different patterns of attachment. And depending on these kinds of attachment patterns, we develop different characteristics. I'm not going to get into all of that again, but um, I do want to give some emphasis that apparently what a secure attachment does is it makes us feel safe. And when we feel safe, as we will see later on, uh, we're less anxious and we are at our best. But again, we're not all so fortunate to have mothers or caretakers who are consistently there for us and who listen, as like Emmy said, listen to our needs and uh, are able to respond to our needs. And... <clears throat> I'm sort of very moved because I feel that us, uh, we are growing as societies or growing, I don't know, developing. Uh, parents are less and less involved with their children and spend less and less time caring for them. And instead, they spend more and more time working. Some of them really have to, because otherwise they will not have the means to provide for what is needed. And some uh, want to escape from the family environment or find no interest in child rearing. So children grow up more and more alone and more and more connected with their iPhones or whatever they have, if they have, or with whoever they find. Um, and I don't know how things are in other countries, but I also see that, <clears throat> in Greece at least, that teachers and um, schools, they, they are also more tired and overworked and concerned about their life and less invested in, in really child rearing. And of course, so much more emphasis on learning languages and learning math and doing the curriculum, you know, uh, that uh, you have from the Ministry of Education instead of really interacting with the children or playing with the children. So this kind of environment is not really getting better. And as we know, uh, the way we are treated as children and the way we relate, the kind of attachment patterns we form uh, as, as babies and in early life affect the way we also form our attachments in adult life. So we very often recreate and form relationships in adult life that are insecure and fearful and suspicious and um, not really motivated from care and love, which I think is probably, you know, the antidote to a lot of our problems. 
But uh, instead, we are growing up with a lot more fear. I see that in the in the media, you know. Whenever I read the news, I read terrible things. I don't read any good news. So there is this culture of fear instead, uh, uh, something that is a little bit more hopeful and optimistic. So Bo uh, Bowlby was talking about attachment patterns in the early 1960s uh, because of his observations between the interaction between mothers and infants. And now we also have uh, neuropsychological findings that sort of testify that these attachment patterns are really true. And they're not only true, but they affect the way our brain is developing and our autonomic nervous system is functioning. So it's not affecting only how we feel, or <laughs> it is affecting how we feel, but how we feel is connected to our brain functioning. Right? So what happens in these early relationships has an effect on the way we are and experience the world and the way we very often automatically react to stimuli. So uh, our brain has been trained and has certain pathways that uses from the more, let's say, primitive part of the brain, the limbic system, not from the higher brain, because it takes some time for uh, the input to go to the higher brain and to be processed, as Amy was talking about, to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Very often we don't have this luxury. We just respond by an automatic response. So it all goes back to uh, these early attachment patterns. And uh, another uh, Daniel, Daniel Hill, has written this very nice book about affect regulation theory. So how our affect is regulated has to do with our attachment patterns. And when we feel safe, we are at our best, right? We are at our best because our autonomic nervous system is regulated. So everything is sort of in balance, right? And when danger appears, our autonomic nervous system responds and we are sort of energized. We are put into a mode of danger. And we have to respond with a fight or flight kind of a response uh, to circumstances or to freeze if it is too scary. Okay, so uh, when affect, as he says, is at, at the heart of our being, it's at the core of our existence. And this is what psychotherapy is all about, is dealing with our affective state with how we feel that we are in the world. So how we are in the world has a lot to do with uh, not only our attachment patterns. I think that I, I had the opportunity to present something on, on, on trauma, uh, fat encounters. And I talked a little bit about developmental trauma, which apparently seems to be the one that is uh, the most important because it has the most impact on our brain functioning. And it's the hardest to change for that reason. Okay, but trauma can really happen on two levels. The one level I have already been talking about is our attachment to our caretakers. So how we're treated and how much uh, we feel secure and safe is very important. It's very important to have a bond, uh, and a, a secure bond, a secure attachment. But I think it's also very important to, to realize that 
the second stage, as we will see with Ericsson, is also very important. How do we separate? Do we separate? Can mother let go of her uh, emerging toddler? How do we deal with the new personality that is developing there and has an opinion and starts to walk and talk and give us trouble sometimes? So the one aspect of um, what happens in our life has to do with our early connections and the other one has to do with how do we um, negotiate our moving away? Because Emmy said very nicely, right? We need to move away and to sort of stay with ourselves and get a little self-centered uh, and, and to sort of think for ourselves what is happening. Can we? So, Ericsson talked to God. I don't know, I think I had another. Oh, no. I thought I had another uh, about Eric Erickson because that is another important theory that I like very much. Uh, and uh, although he talks in the first stage about trust, mistrust, which is another very important concept, so that when we have a secure attachment, we not only feel safe, but we can start trusting. We trust the other person. So there is a, a, a sort of a relationship of trust that starts to build. And he says very nicely that trust creates the virtue of hope. Uh, so when we feel safe and when we trust, we are more hopeful. Right? We are more optimistic about things. But in the second stage, when we start to break away, as I said, because we start to walk and talk and to develop our own personality more and more, and this is why it's very often called the terrible twos, we start to say no to things, right? Eat your egg, no. Do this, no. Go to bed, no. And that's where uh, troubles begin. And very often, uh, young children are made to feel shame and doubt about themselves. And now we have this term toxic shame. Um, but very nicely, again, Erickson says, the virtue of will develops during this stage of autonomy versus shame and doubt. So we start to have a, 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 the beginning of a, a willpower, a will. I want to, I, I don't want to go to bed. I want to stay up. I don't want to eat an egg. I want to eat an apple. Right? It's making choices. And how do parents deal with that is, again, very important. And are we encouraged to have our own voice and to make our own choices? I was working once with a lady that she was being washed by her mother because she couldn't wash herself well enough until she was 14. And she rebelled and she said, no, I don't want you to do, be doing this for me. Uh, and her mother was crazy with cleanliness, of course, as you understand. <clears throat> so how do we deal with? And you see here when we are uh, sort of safe, we play and we, we're OK. But when we feel shame and doubt, we're sort of closed in into our world. And of course, Freud uh, talked about toilet training and our superego starting to develop uh, at that stage, the second stage of, of uh, the anal stage, where uh, because we are being told for the first time, no, you shouldn't pee on your pants, you have to go there. And very often we are shamed for that. And um, so uh, uh, 
this is what you saw on the DNA. Many different theories have been sort of uh, worked together. And because all theories can apply, right? We can integrate all, all sorts of theories in our understanding. It doesn't matter that we are an existential psychotherapist. There are so many theories out there that have so many things to offer us in terms of understanding our existence. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I did want to make a distinction between shame, guilt, and fear. Because there are three very powerful emotions, and there are three emotions that we deal with in psychotherapy all the time. And shame has to do with the core of our being. You know, it's, it, it's very often pre-language kind of thing, where it has to do about who we are, not what we do. Right? Guilt is usually about actions and behaviors and something that we do wrong. But shame has to do with who we are. And I very often have seen, unfortunately, in my private practice, people who uh, feel so ashamed of themselves that they feel that they shouldn't exist. And this is really so painful to see. And I think that one of the ways that, for me, existential theory has helped me, and, and the message that I always try to communicate, is that we all, it's, it, it's as my friend Eric Craig again says, it's a miracle that we are here. We don't have to prove anything. We all are worthy of being. We don't have to prove anything. Right? But very often we feel so ashamed of ourselves that we feel that we have to prove who we are. <clears throat> and of course, guilt uh, has to do with uh, not so much who we are, but how we behave. Uh, and very often our uh, love is being withdrawn when we behave in ways that are not acceptable. So we slowly learn to behave inappropriate ways. Well, some of that is good, and some of that might be dangerous, right? because that leads us slowly to this lack of authenticity, to this uh, alienation from who we really are. And of course, fear is a very natural reaction to danger. But unfortunately, very often, it is overexpressed. Um, and that's where I need to say one word about the danger of overprotection, because we very often talk in trauma about neglect and abuse, and that is the obvious or the more obvious trauma. But there is also this kind of trauma that comes from overprotection, from mothers or parents who are too scared that something will happen to their child. And they, and they want to do everything for them before they even think about it. And, and they say, no, don't, don't do this. I'll do it for you. And this, again, sort of uh, creates a message of certain uncertainty and doubt in the child. Well, maybe I'm not capable, right? Maybe I'm not strong enough. So it affects our mastery and, and the way we view Ourself and and our self esteem, and with no self esteem, hmm, it's very hard to re really do what I talked in the beginning to sort of reach some sort of self actualization. We really need to feel uh, that we're worthy and that there is something good in us and to have a certain belief in ourselves in order to be able to move towards self-actualization. Of course, in that respect also, belongingness is very important. Right? And, and that's why very often in adolescents, uh, young children uh, need to belong to groups. Right? And if they cannot belong to uh, groups that are more, um, let's say, uh, 
health health promoting, they might belong to any kind of group. Okay? And of course, if you go back to what I was saying about their feelings of aloneness and alienation, they might join any kind of group. Okay? Unless they feel heard and they feel that they're part of something there. So all of these ways in which we are brought up and all the ways in which we interact with our family and our extended family and our community affect the way we view ourselves. And the way we view ourselves affects also the way we view others. So we see again this greed, the way we understand ourselves and how we feel about ourselves will affect the way that we view others. And the question is, do we have a positive self-image and a positive image for the other person across the room? Or have we developed these patterns of mistrust and unsafety, so we are very suspicious and uh, we feel that we are in danger. Because that has a lot to do with what Amy was talking about in terms of trying to resolve conflict. Because if you get into a conflict by being mistrustful and scared and, and feeling unsafe, it's very difficult to really be open and to be open to listen to the other person. No, you're really closed and you feel like you need to protect yourself. Right. <clears throat> so let's pause for a moment and think, how open am I and how scared am I? How much do I feel threatened by what others are going to say about me? How important is their views? Right? Sartre used to say others is, uh, are hell. Um, yes, others are hell, but we're also hell for ourselves as well. Right? Because we constantly think about our image and what other people are going to think of us. And we do that because we don't like ourselves and we are not really in very good terms with ourselves. So we are expecting the approval and the acceptance from outside. Right? And we think that if people will like us, then we will like ourselves. Well, sometimes it goes the other way around. If we start liking ourselves, others will start liking us too. And I think that this is the power of psychotherapy. My husband very often criticizes psychotherapy and says, well, you're just working, uh, you know, with individuals and this is so individualistic and, um, you know, you're look not looking at society. I say, yeah, well, you, you have to start from somewhere. And I think the best place to start is by looking at ourselves and, and what we are contributing, what each one of us is contributing to the world. Right? We're not working in psychotherapy to help people to become more selfish. Right? We're helping them to be in better terms with themselves. And I think that the more we are in better terms with ourselves, the more we are in better terms with others. <clears throat> so constantly, we're creating our worldview, and our worldview is constantly changing. And as I said in the beginning, when um, I finished my doctorate, I was trained in a psychodynamic approach, and I was very much um, working on the ontic level. I was my emphasis was very much on the individual and on the self and understanding myself. And uh, as I met uh, phenomenology, 
and all of the more phenomenological theorists, my worldview has changed. And of course, I'm also getting older and hopefully a little wiser. So I understand more and more what Emmy was talking about in the morning, that we cannot survive on our own. Right? We need others. And I'm a prime example of that, because as probably some of you know, I, I have been born with a chronic hereditary blood disorder, so I've been transfused for all my life. So I probably have received blood from over 3,000 donors. So if there are no others in my life, I wouldn't be here uh, to be talking to you. And again, talking about the ontological level, if I wasn't fortunate to be brought up at just the right time when medical advancements were happening, again, I wouldn't have survived. And if I wasn't fortunate enough to be born in Greece when these medical advancements were also being followed, then I, again, I wouldn't have survived. And if I wasn't fortunate enough to have been born in a family where they didn't feel that I was something less than other kids because I had this blood disorder, again, I wouldn't be standing in front of you. So where is our freedom? Where is our freedom? I always, as a, as a teenager, and I said, this is what I, I dreamt of. I dreamt that we are free. We are free to make our own choices. But to what extent, really? How free are we? We have so many circumstances that are not of our choosing. Right now, Yes, Emmy has brought a very hopeful message. But how much can we each do in the situation that we are living right now? Hopefully, if we all unite our forces, we could do something more, right? So united we stand, that's true as well. So my worldview has changed, and I understand that we are all one. We are both me and other. We are both separate and connected. And there is this constant dialectic, this tension between me and other. Uh, I had the opportunity to present last year at the Third World Congress in Athens this uh, pr presentation about authentic historicalness and making our history our own. Because as I said, relating my story it was very important for me to make my history my own. This is who I am, can't change. And it has its bad sides and its good sides, as it does for everybody. So we sort of all need to reach a certain kind of reconciliation <clears throat> to embrace our history and to make it our own with whatever has happened. So in this effort that I'm creating, uh, this uh, connection between developmental theories and existential concerns, I've talked a little bit about these uh, primary dialectical tensions. There are these tensions right, that we face. It's, it's the tension between me and other. It's, it's, it's this tension between freedom and security, right? because very often we have to, to sort of step outside of our security if we really want to be free. Right? And, and this tension between self-worth and self-doubt. Okay. These are not resolvable, and this is what I call them dialectical tensions, because they're always there and we're constantly negotiating this me-other dilemma and this freedom, security, and this self-efficiency, self-deficiency kind of... Uh, right? We're, of course, negotiating a lot more. Uh, we're 
constantly negotiating our meaning in life. We are constantly negotiating <laughs> our outlook on things. Okay, but I feel that these are three very important dilemmas and three very important tensions that we are dealing with. So, focusing a little bit for my last few minutes on this me-other dialectical tension. We very often, again, talk in psychotherapy about boundaries. Where do I end and where does the other person begin? And how do I set my boundaries? We do need to have boundaries. We do need to be able to protect ourselves from people, that, especially that are toxic people. Right? But it's also very important in relationships, and I guess Katerina um, was alluding to that. Right? How do we, uh, how much space do we leave in our relationships for the other person? How much freedom do we allow? And especially how much respect do we have for one another? But as I said in the beginning, I think, uh, or maybe I didn't say it, but the way we treat ourselves and the way we respect ourselves is the way we treat others. The way we feel and respect uh, is, not, is not something different. It's not that I respect myself and I disrespect others. I don't think this is possible. So... It's very important to build a culture of respect and care for one another and to be able to, to listen and provide for one another. So how do we build bridges? And what kind of build bridges do we build? It's a very important question. And I'm grateful that I'm here. And thank you for listening to me. And I hope that we will hear a lot of very interesting things today and tomorrow. Thank you. Hey, do you have any questions before we go to the break lunch? I guess we have a spot for one question in case if there is. Hocam ben şeyi merak ediyorum. Ee, şimdi burada hani bağlanmadan bahsettik. Ee, eğer ki hani bir bu attachment figür e, çok muğlak bir yerdeyse belirsizse bizim için böyle bir ebeveyn tarafından yetiştirildiyse bir çocuk öyle bir noktada o zaman bu onun benlik algısına hani nasıl bir katkı sağlar? Nasıl bir benlik geliştirebilir? Hani madem bunun önemini vurguluyorsak Hı. onu merak ettim. Okay. Since we've been talking about attachment theory. Excuse me. So since we have been talking about the attachment theory, uh, the question is when the attachment figure is kind of vague, kind of am ambiguous, how would that affect the development of the child? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on, on that, but uh, it creates an insecure kind of attachment, which means that the child very often uh, is not uh, able to rely on others and sort of turns more inwards. Right? So uh, there is a, a little bit more of what Ericsson would talk about as the terms of mistrust, because there is an insecurity there. Can I depend on this person? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Uh, and some, uh, well, what Bowlby has been talking about is that the disorganized kind of attachment where it is very unpredictable, it, it's the worst, right? Because the child doesn't know how to respond. So it is probably better to have a disengaged mother rather than a sometimes engaged, sometimes disengaged mother, because that causes more of a confusion and the child doesn't know which way to go, right? Okay, whereas in the disengaged mother, 
the child is very clear. I cannot depend on mother. I have to make it on my own. Right? Sorry to, to say that way. She's crazy. Right? So there is no way for me to make sense or, or to, to really even try. Okay, so it's sometimes better than this kind of double um, ambivalent kind of attachment where mother is there and is not there. Of course, you understand from what I'm saying how much this all depends also on the mental health of the mother. Right? Eugenia, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Eugenia. Thank you.